thinking about the facts, and uh, there's one narrative, one very interesting uh, and very <clears throat> important story that we've mentioned briefly, but we haven't spoken about. And uh, I've been saving that up for the gospel meeting this afternoon. So we're going to think just briefly this afternoon about the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. And of course, to read about that, we need to go to the book of the Acts, um, chapter number eight. Acts, phase chapter eight, and uh, we'll read from verse number 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah, read Isaiah the prophet. And then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near, and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, As can I, except some man should guide me. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip, and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself, or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth, and began at the same scripture, and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. And we know that God will bless to us the reading of his precious word. I mentioned uh, on uh, just last night that when we come to the conversion in chapter 9 of the apostle Paul as he became, Saul as he then was, we're dealing really with a very atypical conversion. We're dealing with a very unusual conversion. But in the experience of this Ethiopian, you know, there were details that would be different probably from the story of conversion that many of us could tell here. And yet, what we see here is, is, a, is a story of conversion that is not unusual, but it's extraordinary nonetheless. And of course, there is no such thing as a story of conversion. There is no such thing as a testimony that is, is not remarkable. And if it was true that, uh, as we saw last night, Paul never forgot the experience that was his, on the road to Damascus, we can be sure that this Ethiopian eunuch who appears on the page of scripture and disappears off down to Ethiopia and we never see him again, we can be sure that he never forgot this special day when he encountered the evangelist, but more than that, when he came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as his savior. He got saved the first time he ever heard the gospel preached. And I know that I'm speaking this afternoon to some of you, and you've heard the gospel preached many, many times. And you've never trusted Christ. You've never realized what this Ethiopian eunuch realized, that when the Lord Jesus Christ was led as a lamb to the slaughter, when he went to Calvary's cross and suffered and bled and died, it was for you. You've never yet trusted him as your Savior. But I tell you this afternoon, this would be a wonderful day. This would be a day that you would never, ever forget if you would do what the Ethiopian did. 
and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are some lovely lessons that we can learn from this familiar story. Just the very first thing that I want us to see is this, that, that God was interested in the soul of this man. You know, Philip is, uh, is redirected, really. Philip is redirected by quite a, a considerable uh, work that has been uh, going on in, uh, in the villages of the Samaritans. And people are being saved. And if, if it had been up to Philip, likely Philip would just have remained there and he would have carried on preaching. But he gets a command. The angel of the Lord says to him, Arise, go towards the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And so Philip leaves Samaria. He heads for this area that is so much in the news today. And you say, why does he go? He goes because God is interested in the soul of this man from Ethiopia. And you know, I'm glad to be able to tell you this afternoon that God is interested in you. One of the wonderful things, you know, if we were writing the history of early Christianity, we would be looking for the, the big movements. We would be looking for the institutions. We would be wanting to describe it in that way. But when we get to the book of the Acts, there's really none of that. The book of the Acts is full of the stories of individuals, and it's full of the conversion stories of individuals. And you couldn't read the book of the Acts without realizing this, that we have a God who's interested in individuals. If you're in the meeting this evening and you're not saved, please be assured that we desire, we greatly desire your salvation. But I'm very conscious of this, that no matter how greatly I might desire your salvation, no matter how greatly I might be interested in seeing your soul saved, and to be honest, I wish I were more concerned and more interested. But I represent a God and his interest in your soul, his interest in your salvation is far greater than mine ever, ever could hope to be. And in fact, his interest in saving you is greater even than your interest in being saved. Never, never, never think. Never you think that if you want to get God's salvation, you're going to somehow have to twist God's arm. Never you think that God is a distant, distant and a, 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 an uninterested God who, who you have to somehow coax into blessing you. God it desires to save your soul. He loved you so much that for you he gave his son to the awful suffering and death of Calvary's cross. He commended his love towards you, commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And thank God I can tell you this evening that there's salvation for you and there's a God who is ready to pardon. He's ready to save. And friend, this afternoon, he's interested in you. And what a tragedy. If in response to his interest, you've just got indifferent. And in response to his great love, you've just got carelessness. And you've heard so often, as this Ethiopian discovered for the first time, Heard so often of the one who was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And you've never realized it was for me. Never has it touched your heart to appreciate. Uh, the one who went to Calvary's cross. The one who suffered there on the center cross. Suffered for you. So that your sins might be forgiven. This, this story is the story of a seeking God. But it's also the story of a seeking sinner. You know, this man, this was a remarkable man. This, uh, this eunuch of great authority. And, uh, and Luke, as he writes the account, he, he's, he's wanting us to understand just, just uh, how unusual this man, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, who had charge of all her treasure. And he's really sort of piling up these terms. We can understand this is a man this is a man who is, uh, who is a very important position. This is a man who's a very distinguished man. This is a man who's a very special man. You know, this is the sort of man that, uh, that you would have liked to know. Uh, and people would just have, 
he was he was like the uh, uh, he was like the chief finance minister in the in the under Kandeshi, queen of the Ethiopians, a very wealthy empire at this time. This this man was a this man was a, a big noise. This man was something out of the ordinary. He had this remarkable, this outstanding job, clearly a man of great abilities. And yet it's clear that he wasn't a satisfied man. And he wasn't a happy man. Why? Because he goes all the way to Jerusalem. And he goes all the way to Jerusalem and he acquires there a copy of scriptures. Why? Because there's a void. There's an emptiness in his heart and all his wealth and all his prestige and all his power and all his importance cannot fill that gap. You know, there's a great lie that Satan tells men and women. And the lie that Satan tells men and women and boys and girls is this, that it's possible to be happy without God. That it's possible to be satisfied without God. And, uh, and that lie is propagated to us in so many different ways. And Satan is just trying to conceal from us, just trying to hide from us, trying to drown out the little voice that speaks within the heart of every man and woman, boy and girl, that is not satisfied. Because we have been, we have been designed. We were created for fellowship with God. And apart from him, we can never never really be happy some of you when you if you if you, uh, if you take keep on physics i think it's in the, the leading search uh, curriculum or certainly it used to be you'll be learning about uh, pascal's law to do with pressure and vacuums blaise pascal the man who devised that law uh, he was a he was a great chemist he was a bit of a, a polymath really but he was also a believer in the lord jesus christ he did a lot of work on on vacuums he famously said, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man. And true it is that there is, a, there is a space, there is a gap. And I know you younger ones think that satisfaction is to be found in the world. I know you think that if you could just have enough money, get enough stuff, have a sufficiently important job, drive a sufficiently big and fancy car, live in a house that all these things would, would just satisfy you and bring you happiness. That's a life of Satan. The hymn writer or the chorus writer put it like this. There is no satisfaction without. S-A-L V-A-T I-O-N. But in actual fact, we could go a little bit further than that. Not just that there's no satisfaction without salvation. That's true. There's no satisfaction without the Lord Jesus Christ. And here was a man, materially speaking, career-wise, he had everything he could ever have desired, but he had discovered this, that the broken cisterns of earth, the joys of earth, can never bring lasting satisfaction and he's searching for something to meet his need he doesn't make a bad stab at it to be fair he, he of all the places he could have gone he makes his way to jerusalem and of course jerusalem was where the temple was you know he would have seen he was he was a he was no stranger to to find buildings but what he would have seen in Jerusalem would have been a little bit out of the ordinary. He would have seen the temple. He wouldn't have seen into the temple, but he would have seen the priests in their movement to and fro. He would have seen the sacrifices as they were brought to the temple there at Jerusalem. He would have seen so much going on. And, uh, and maybe he thought in the, in the ritual of the temple, in the religion of the temple in all the activity of the temple maybe i could find the thing that would meet my need maybe i would find the thing that would fill the vacuum in my heart and you know there are still plenty of people who think that the answer the answer to this this the emptiness of our life of, of human life 
is, is found in, in ritual and is found in religion. And there are plenty of people who think that they can be right with God on the basis of what they are able to do. But this man, as he went to Jerusalem, he went to a system that had, oh yes, it was, it was divine in its institution, but it was a system that had rejected Christ. It was a system that was just empty ritual and empty formality, and there was nothing in it. And not only could it not satisfy this man's need in time, and it couldn't, more solemn yet, it was unable to fit him for God's great eternity. And you see, if it, is, if it is true that we have this need to have the God-shaped vacuum in our heart filled, well, that's, that's a serious need. That's a real need. But there's another, and I don't know if it's right to say it's a greater need, but, but maybe it is. There's another need that men and women have. And that need is this. To have their sins forgiven. And one of the things that this man would have realized. As he stood there in Jerusalem and as he saw the offerings being brought. He would have begun to realize that sin is serious. Because that whole temple system had been designed by God among other things. To make it clear that sin is serious. Because those animal sacrifices would be brought. And their blood would be shed. And those, those sacrifices, every one of them, bore testament to the fact that God takes sin seriously. Because God had said, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And I want to tell you, friend, if it was there that the Ethiopian eunuch learned that lesson. That we need to learn that lesson this afternoon. You know, one of the reasons that we, we have this need for God, one of the reasons that we have this God-shaped vacuum in our heart is simply this, that our sin has separated us from God. It has hid His face from us. And that happened way back at the beginning in the Garden of Eden. You remember that when Adam and Eve sinned, God put them out. And instead of communion, there was that flaming sword that moved this way and that. And the way back to God was blocked and barred because of sin. And even as they stood, as the Ethiopian stood there at the temple, he would have seen that, that holy building. He would have seen the outer walls. Might have caught a glimpse of the inner walls. But, but God, the presence of God was, was right in there in the middle of the temple. And he couldn't get at it. He couldn't get close to it. Why? Because he was a sinner. And I think actually that his trip to Jerusalem, rather than meeting this man's need, it might just have made him more acutely aware than he ever had been before of the need that was his. And you know, friend, this afternoon, boys and girls, it's so important that we would understand our need of God, to understand that I'm a guilty sinner. Mind you, it's a solemn thing to be a sinner. It's a solemn thing to be a sinner because sin, we've said already, sin separates us from God. It will do that in time. But you know that it will separate, sin will separate you from God, not just for time, but for all eternity. And to leave this world still in your sins, to go out into eternity, is to be separated from God forever. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, he told that story, didn't he? Of the rich man of Lazarus. There's a lot of very solemn things in that story. That rich man is tormented, Abraham says. That rich man, as he finds himself in hell, he, uh, he longs for a, a drop of water to cool his tongue. But in all the solemn details of that story, there's one perhaps that stands out above all the rest. And it's what Abraham says to a man, a man who doesn't, he doesn't even aspire to escaping from hell, but he wonders if Lazarus can come with a drop of water. And the Lord Jesus Christ says between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. And listen, friend, if you go out to eternity in your sins, you'll be separate. Not only will you be under the judgment of God, not only will you suffer the torments of hell for all eternity, but you'll be separated from God forever and forever. This, this Ethiopian eunuch, 
He, in spite of his wealth, he felt his need. And in Jerusalem, he had discovered this, that uh, religion and ritual and liturgy could never really meet that need. But you know, there was one great thing that happened when he was in Jerusalem. He obtained a copy of the prophecy of Isaiah. Now, likely this would have cost him a, a very considerable amount of money. But he's sitting in his chariot and he's going, and uh, he's been uh, he's been working at this this scroll for quite a bit. He's got all the way through. There was no chapters in those days. He's got all the way through to what we call Isaiah chapter fifty three. Philip is sent by God, and it's how he said, you know, Philip arrived just at the right time. Isaiah is a, a great prophecy. There are some chapters of it, and I wouldn't fancy trying to preach the gospel from it. And uh, if I had to pick, Isaiah 53 is just where I would want to begin in preaching the gospel. And, and God arranges the appointment so that as, as Philip draws close to the chariot, the Ethiopian is sitting there in the chariot, in, in those days, it's, it's a relatively recent thing that people read silently. In those days, he would have been reading it out loud. Had Philip, Philip's heart must have skipped a beat when he recognized what the man was reading. And he must have thought, this is, this is divine timing here because he's come, to this, he's come to this glorious action. In a great chapter that says so much about the Lord Jesus Christ, he reads about one who was led as a sheep to the slaughter, like a lamb dumb before the shear. You see, this man has been to Jerusalem. This man has been to the temple. And whatever else he had seen in Jerusalem, he would have seen time and time again animal sacrifices being led by those who were guilty of sin, those who were conscious of sin, those who required, desired communion with God. Again and again and again, he would have seen the sacrifices go. He knew what sacrifice was about. He knew that sacrifice involved an innocent victim who would pay the price of somebody else's sin. And he had, been, he had been primed by his visit in Jerusalem to understand what was going on here. But it was a great question. The great question that he asks is this. He says, uh, who is the prophet speaking of? Is he speaking about himself? Or is he speaking of some other man? Well, you know, Philip is the only man in the Bible who's, who's called an evangelist, but you wouldn't need to be an evangelist to recognize your cue like that. He opens his mouth and he began at the same scripture. It says he preached unto him Jesus. Oh, he would have told me, you know, you know those sacrifices that, that you saw being offered there in Jerusalem. He would have told him those were just little pictures. Those were just little prototypes foreshadowings of a greater sacrifice. That whole sacrificial system indeed was given by God to point forward to the sacrifice of one that would come. And he says, I want to tell you about this man called Jesus. Oh, well, he, he's more than a man called Jesus. Because you'll see when we get to verse 37, the Ethiopian, as he goes down, or as he, he's not down in the water, he's about to go down in the water. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Philip began at that scripture. He said, There's, I want to tell you about a man called Jesus. And he says, I want you to understand he's more than a man. I want you to understand, Mr. Ethiopian, that he's the son of God. I want you to understand that he's the promised Christ. And he preached unto him, Jesus. I tell you, there's nothing else he could have done. You see, when someone is, when someone is dissatisfied with this world, when someone is longing for a relationship with God, when somebody is conscious of their sins, there is nobody else and nothing else to which we can point. Because it's only Christ. He is the only Savior, mighty to save. He is the only one who is able to meet the sinner's need. He is the only one to give forgiveness of sins. Listen, friend. You want to be in heaven. It's Christ and nothing else. You want to know your sins forgiven. It's Christ and nothing else. You want to know God as your father. Then it's Christ and nothing else. And it's our responsibility this evening just to do. Just to do what Philip did. Preach unto you Jesus. And tell you how God's son came from heaven. And came into this world. Was born in Bethlehem. Born of Mary. To tell you that he went to the cross. 
how he died. Not, not as the victim of circumstances that he couldn't control. Not as an example. He died as a sacrifice. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before shears is dumb. And he had done nothing worthy of death. And because of his sinless purity, death had no power at all upon him. Death had no claim over him. And yet, yet he went to the cross. And in the fulfillment of all the sacrifices that had been offered in Judaism, he offered himself without spot to God. And he paid the price to deal with sin. And if you put your trust in him, your sins will be forgiven. And you'll have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, that was what the Ethiopian did. When they came to the water, he said, when he asked to be baptized, that the crunch question was this. The thing that, not, not so much, do, do you feel saved, Mr. Ethiopian? Not have you had a vision or an experience? No, the question that mattered was this. Do you believe? You see what matters, the question that matters for you this evening. In the light of eternity, with your never dying soul in the balance, have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? God's word is, is, is completely clear about this. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And if you believe in him, Trust in the work that he finished on Calvary's cross when he offered himself as a perfect and a satisfactory sacrifice to God. Then your sins will be forgiven and you'll be saved. But there's no salvation. Neither is there salvation in any other. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The Ethiopian eunuch says, I believe Jesus Christ is the son of God. And we love what it says about this man. He disappears off the page of scripture. We never see him again. But our last view of him is in the chariot. He goes on his way to rejoice. He had been a dissatisfied man. Now he's satisfied. Likely he had been a sad man. Now he's rejoicing. He had been a condemned man. Now he's been forgiven. I tell you, friend, it could all be yours this evening. You, if you trusted Christ, even as this meeting draws to a close, I promise you this. For time, for eternity, you'll never regret. What can equal joy divine? Or what can sweeter be than knowing that the soul is saved? For all eternity. Safe in the Lord. <clears throat> without a doubt. By <clears throat> virtue of the blood. But nothing can destroy the life. That's his. With Christ. In God. Do you believe? Do you trust Christ? And like this man from Ethiopia. Your need would all be met. Your sins all forgiven. Your eternal destiny secure. And like him. You could go on your way rejoice. May God bless him. He bless his word. Our Father, we bow again before thee. We give thee thanks for thy word. Thank thee for the story of this man from Ethiopia and how the very first time he heard the gospel preached, he trusted Christ for the salvation of his soul. We thank thee that so many years have passed and still we're preaching the same gospel about the same Savior. And we thank thee, our Father, that it has the same power to meet the need of men and women, boys and girls. We ask now that thou will bless thy word. We're thankful for all who have listened this evening, and we pray thy blessing upon each one. We look to thee, our Father, for any who are still in their sins, that they'll trust Christ for salvation. It would be our great desire that there would be some who would go on their way rejoicing. Now, our Father, we commit ourselves into thy hand. Pray that thou will part us with thy blessing. Pray for the traveling mercies that are needed. 
We give thee thanks for a time of renewed fellowship. And pray for thy blessing upon the assembly here in Skibbereen for each member of it. And commit ourselves all to thee, returning thanks in the precious and worthy name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.